maybe uh, we, can, uh, we can just quickly run through the, the three topics that we are covering generally. I mean, Musa, you're talking about policies, is it? Uh, what will you be talking about? Your main... Basically, uh, Chris, just exit strategies. Okay, uh, what, so policies what are... right, as such. Yeah. In terms of, okay, all right. And, and Munira, you'll be, so that I won't overlap with you guys. Um, my part is more the sort of society, so NGO CSO work. Okay, all right. Okay, so I, I will focus on the individual then, so that uh, you minimize the overlap. Okay, gotcha, oh, guys. great. Great. Okay. Right, Dr. Chris, your questions will be, what changes should we make in our personal lives or practices after MCO is lifted? Okay. Thanks. We're actually live on Facebook already. Miss mm. um, Chin, would you like me to uh, kickstart or uh, I think I'll just kickstart if that's okay with all, all of you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. We'll still wait yeah, for Maybe another two minutes. Of course. You start exactly at 11 a.m.? Yes. Okay. Mm Mr. King, you're still in the States, uh, you're still in UK, is it? No, I'm back in uh, Malaysia since oh, about oh, a month oh. now. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So you came back before they had to quarantine people, is it? Yep, <laughs> quite a, I, I thought it was a pretty smart move. Well, my, my son is enjoying his 12 days in Sunway Velocity. And he's, he's getting bored with the food there already. Two more days, oh, said, two more days. Two more days, okay, okay, well, that's good. Days. But then she has to come back and taste her mother's, his mother's food. That could be more challenging. <laughs> um, how about we get started, everyone? What do you think? Your call. Okay. Um, so Hi. A, a note. Baratan, okay for you? Yes, yes, I think we should. Uh, I think we Excellent. should, yeah. Okay. Uh, but let's let's first check uh, one more time. Miss Chin and uh, Yokting, are we broadcasting and are we on Facebook already? Yes. Okay, let's get started. Good morning, Malaysia. Good morning, yes. everyone. Um, my name is uh, Sui King um, and I'm a physician and public health specialist by training. Today, I'll be very pleased to be your moderator for the webinar that's called Beating COVID with the whole of society or the whole of Malaysia. Joining us today, we have three uh, excellent panelists, uh, each representing different parts of the effort against COVID. As you all know, the uh, pandemic of COVID uh, is not only a medical or a health or a scientific problem, it's actually a problem that's also economic, social, psychological, even political. And therefore, we need to consider how we can bring in the whole of society to fight against COVID, not just relying on the medical and health professionals. That's the purpose of today's webinar, to see what the entire society in Malaysia is doing. We have three panelists with us today, and I'll introduce them very briefly in turn, and each of them will answer questions uh, that are very specific to their areas of expertise, as well as their areas of passion. Firstly, Dr. Musa Nordin, 
who is a consultant pediatrician in private practice. He's also the advisor to the Islamic Medical Association of Malaysia, or IMAMS, Relief and Response Team, or we call it IMARET. So Dr. Dr. Musa Nordin will speak to us in his capacity as a pediatrician, also as the advisor to an NGO. And he'll talk to us a little bit more about the policies, about the uh, exit strategies, shall we say, from the MCO period. The second panelist that we have is Dr. Siti Noor Munirah, or I'll call her Dr. Munirah after this. Dr. Munirah just came back from the UK, where she trained as a, a specialist in family practice and uh, also spent 12 years in NGO work, both in the UK and in Malaysia. She's won uh, several awards and recognition for her efforts in NGO work uh, in Malaysia and the UK. And she'll speak with us as a coordinator of Project Wawasan Rakyat. So she's both a doctor and a humanitarian. She'll speak to us about the society and uh, what all of society is doing in the NGO space in Malaysia as we fight COVID. The third panelist that we have is Dr. Dr. Christopher Lee. He's uh, one of uh, Malaysia's uh, more famous doctors, uh, trained as an infectious diseases specialist, previously heading up Sungai Bulo Hospital, um, the infectious unit, uh, diseases uh, uh, unit of uh, Sungai Bulo Hospital, that is Malaysia's number one center for infectious diseases. He's recently retired from the Ministry of Health. His previous role was as Deputy Director General of the Research and Technical Division. So Dr. Dr. Christopher Lee will come to us uh, with his insights about uh, the practices that we can have in terms of our personal lives after the uh, uh, MCO period is uh, lifted. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the three panelists that we have as we talk about the whole of society response in fighting COVID. So my job as a moderator today is really to help us keep the time and to draw out usable insights from the panelists. And we'll start with Dr. Dr. Musa, who will deliver, say, about a short monologue as he tells us about um, um, the policy implications of the exit strategy. What we will do today is to have 45 minutes of uh, uh, speeches, shall we say, speeches uh, from the three panelists. And the next 45 minutes, the second half of the webinar, we'll take questions from the audience. You can ask questions in two ways. The first way you can ask questions is by typing it out on the Zoom channel or typing it out on the Facebook channel. And I will um, moderate and look at the questions and then assign them to uh, the moderators. We want to have uh, things that are a bit more interactive today. So it's not just, I say, um, questions and answers, but also very interactive. So we'll get started with uh, Dr. Dr. Musa or Dr. Musa or Musa as he prefers to be called. Uh, Musa, please go ahead and uh, tell us uh, with the curve of um, the COVID-19 in Malaysia already bending and already flattening a little bit, what should be foremost in our thinking as we plan for our exit strategies? Over to you, Musa. Dr. Musa, you may be on mute. I'm so sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, Swiki. Assalamu alaikum, peace and blessings. Uh, good morning and uh, salam Ramadan. Uh, thank you very much, Swiki. Uh, Chris Munira, ladies and gentlemen, just before I kick off, can I just make very quickly uh, three, three caveats? Lah. First, uh, this opinion is mine. Uh, it is not Emirates. It's extremely important, yeah? Uh, I am responsible for this opinion, uh, but having said that, these guys in the Marriott uh, are wonderful. They are young doctors and volunteers. They've traveled from Perlis to Johor, Sabah and Sarawak to distribute PPEs, ventilators, you know, amazing. They spent about 3 million ringgit, which they collected. And the good thing is that these young boys and girls are synergizing with MRA, uh, with, uh, with uh, Mercy Malaysia, with the edge and uh, with Mr. DIY, and they've just delivered 8 million worth of consignments, including to Sabah and Sarawak. So important, this opinion is mine, even though I do help them in Imari. And the second point is that in God we trust, all else we audit. So this brings me to the third point, i.e. I am a, an absolute skeptic. And I believe it's part of the culture of, of good science, of good research. Yeah? and skepticism that is based on evidence and good practices. Um, so it is not meant to discredit any person, any one person or any one institution, yeah? Uh, unlike, unfortunately, that is the situation in social media. As a scientist, you know, we do not have constraints, whether it's with regards to our political masters or with regards to the rakyat. 
we base ourselves on evidence. You just look at Anthony Fauci, the director of the CDC, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, how he demonstrated the art of medicine when dealing with a very difficult president and with divisions in the American public. So that's my, my, my brief. I agree with you without a doubt that we have done very well with bending the curve. And touch wood provide no surges, no surprises. We should be now thinking very carefully, very seriously of a safe, and in, in my opinion, a middle of the road exit strategy. What do you mean by this? Not too rapid that it will invite waves of, of uh, COVID disease and neither too slow that it would hurt further the much better economy. So I will summarize my immediate thoughts on three important points. Number one is the first crucial element of a COVID exit strategy is mass testing. The WHO has reaffirmed this mass testing when in two out of its six pre-requirements, it says transmission must be controlled, early case finding and testing is essential to stop transmission. And the European Union Research Group has said that the availability of a large-scale testing is a precondition for lifting social distancing in the future. So testing is important because it tells us, it tells the government, it tells the Ministry of Health, the running rate of infection, and whether whatever we are doing has made an impact. Yeah. And it enables us to isolate the new cases, trigger tracking, and stop spread of disease. And secondly, it confirms immunity because healthy immune person can therefore return to work while those who are infected are treated and isolated and contact tracing is, is triggered. So we have to benchmark ourselves against the best, you know, against the likes of South Korea and Australia and New Zealand, which are actually seeing single digit cases of COVID declining COVID cases, yeah? And now relaxing their lockdown, yeah? So I give you, being objective, give you figures. Malaysia is about 4.8% positive rate. And our testing is 3,700 per million population. Korea is 1.9% at 11,000 per million population. Australia is 1.5% positive rate, 17 per million, 7,000 per million. So the lower the positive rate, the better it is. So I am saying that we cannot be satisfied sitting at 4.8% with high risk groups in our backyard. You know, we're talking about 6 million migrant workers, 175,000 refugees. So we have to keep our radar for, for the other major clusters, yeah? The tablet group, our border controls, healthcare workers, even the political clusters, you might, I may add. And another important group is the asymptomatic COVID positive. This is 40%. Don't have any symptoms and they can spread the infection. Right? That's one. Secondly is tracking. Yeah? Success doesn't mean that it's zero case. No. It means that we have zero tolerance for new cases. Any one case, any new cluster, we act immediately, track them, track the persons around them, isolate them, treat them, yeah? Good contact tracing, but it's labor intensive. Malaysia is doing it manually. I think we need to go the Singapore way, the Korean way, where we use tracking apps, all right? Uh, maybe the Korean way is very invasive. Huh? upon our, our, our personal lives, yeah? And the third point, if I may make, is that we have, through flattening the curve, ensured that our health services and infrastructure is protected. We have enough ventilators, yeah? And, but more important, I think, we need to make sure that our CFR, case fatality rate, is kept low. Yes, we are 1.5, but remember when we started at, in 18 March, we were 0.4%. So, and this is where our, the, the likes of Chris is very important because they need to detect early, 
the cytokine storm, put in the anti-inflammatories and make sure that they are not intubated or ventilated because we've known, we've seen that the ventilated cases in the intensive care units, the mortality rate is in the excess of 70%. So I think those are the three points I like to make. Mass testing, tracking, and preserving and protecting our healthcare services. Thank you very much, Speaking. Terumusa, thank you very much. Um, the World Health Organization has recently, at, at least on the 14th of April, released a list of six criteria, some of which you've already mentioned. Uh, would you be able to maybe share some thoughts about the six criteria, how we can potentially adapt that to Malaysia as we consider the exit strategy, please? Yeah, I think I've, 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 I've focused on the most important criteria. Yeah? They mentioned that you need to make sure that the cases are declining for the next two weeks. Yeah because the incubation period of, uh, of COVID or, or SARS-2 is 14 days. So you need to make sure that there is a decline yeah, in the cases, which, which the likes of New Zealand, uh, Austria, uh, Australia, and Korea is seeing. Uh, China is in single digits now, right? But the concerns now is that they're seeing the importation of cases. And that's why I emphasize that we need to be extremely vigilant with our body controls. Yeah, that is extremely important uh, cluster. And in this case, I think I'm very concerned about our neighbors, uh, Indonesia. Uh, and, and what was even more uh, frightening because uh, Jokowi in his, uh, President Jokowi, Pak pa President mengatakan bahawa, he has looked at all the curves and he's not convinced that lockdown works. So I actually sent a message and said, Pak, actually lockdown works. All right. Once we've got it locked down, then we begin to plan our exit strategies. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thanks, Dr. Musa. Um, as a summary from what Dr. Musa has said, uh, three things, mass testing, number two, tracking, number three, protecting the health service and considering the fact that lockdowns have worked. But lockdowns have also carried a bit of, a, shall, shall we say, a social, even um, economic and a livelihood cost as well to Malaysians. And this is where I'd like to shift the conversation to uh, Dr. Siti Noor Munira. You've been working a lot with uh, NGOs very recently as, you, as we... Um, are working in the MCO period. The MCO period in Malaysia has perhaps caused a bit of hardship as well. So what's it like in, from the ground, uh, Munira? Um, and what are society's efforts and what are NGOs doing to meet the demands of MCO? Over to you, Munira. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good morning. Thank you, Dr. Kaur, uh, Dr. Musa, Dr. Christopher. Um, so as we embark on our 40th day and sixth week of the MCO movement control order, I'd like to talk from the perspective of the society and nation at large from two important aspects. So one is how the efforts from within civil society has been monumental in supporting the government's efforts in battling COVID-19 and indirectly helping to flatten the curve. The other is how parts of the society has been significantly affected by the MCO, in particularly um, certain vulnerable groups to which if we don't as a nation give due attention may indirectly hinder or even backfire all our efforts all this while to combat this deadly virus and I hope to explain both a little further. Now first let's look at how in Malaysia specifically we managed to somewhat apply the whole of society approach and one of the most obvious which has been mentioned by Dr Musa is how our society stepped in to help with the shortage of PPEs and I have to say the efforts of fellow Malaysians have been nothing short of phenomenal. NGOs, CSOs, companies, individuals from all races, religions and backgrounds in their own capacities took part in fundraising, sourcing and supplying ready-made PPEs to our healthcare institutions. And some are also making DIY PPEs at, at a large scale. Now, this, despite this amazing combined effort by civil society, it served well as a bridge or buffer for the government to step up and fill in the due ongoing PPE requirements, but it would not be sustainable long-term. And as we reached the sort of fourth week of MCO, we started to observe don donor exhaustion as everyone had already poured in their contributions during the earlier critical phase. And some platforms that had been formed that were dependent on these donations have had to slowly and reluctantly stop as they could not contribute any further. I would like now to shift our focus to the efforts by civil society addressing many other issues besides PPE shortage, which will also lead to the second aspect I mentioned earlier, which are the vulnerable groups significantly affected during the MCO. So I'd like, first of all, for, first of all, for us to imagine ourselves as part of a huge spider web, 
hopefully is an analogy for us to realize how important it is to acknowledge other groups in the society that many of us are not even remotely connected to. Some we may never have realized existed, or maybe those communities that we actively disconnect ourselves from. When we realize we are part of this spider web, whether we like it or not, any weakness in the spider web will affect us directly or indirectly. Hence, it is actually in our best interest to keep the whole of the spider web strong. And so goes the saying, we are only as strong as our weakest link. Now, I will use the examples of the efforts by our members of Project Oas and Rakyat to demonstrate several of these vulnerable groups that we have been addressing during the MCO and the concerns that we should have as a nation and what we hope the government will step up to provide for as well. So our first project during the MCO under Project Oas and Rakyat, which I am leading, is providing childcare support for our healthcare frontline staff. Which, one was, which was one of their main concerns with schools and nurseries being closed. So how are they going to continue working and battling COVID-19 if their children aren't being taken care of? Hence, through our child care fund and donations from generous Malaysians, Alhamdulillah, we managed to subsidize 5,456 hours of child care from day two of MCO till yesterday, amounting to 64,462 ringgit. However, our funds are now starting to slow down, similar to other funds, and we are concerned about the fate of families of frontliners once we are no longer able to continue the funding support. We're also very aware that we've not managed to cover other frontline staff who are not in the healthcare se sector, such as the police and other essential services. Our collaborating partner, KidoCare, also only operates in Klang Valley, and we've had many requests from mothers and parents in other states who, to provide childcare, and which we have not managed to address yet. And we've already witnessed very sadly one death of a baby in Clanton when her mother was a doctor had to bring the baby to work because of lack of childcare. So childcare is absolutely critical and we would really like to see the government organizing structured childcare support for all for staff of essential services, especially if there is a consideration of staggered lifting of the NCO. So while this is pertaining to children of frontliners, we then have the concern of the many other children in Malaysia during the NCO. Groups such as Said Azmi's Puak Payong and Fadlina Sidi's Fami are addressing children who are not safe in their own homes. We have children going hungry while parents have complete loss of income. We have children subject to increasing domestic violence as stress level levels rise and there's no escape or respite to safety, which previously could have been their schools. We have the homeless children, the refugee children, the stateless children who are already vulnerable even before the MCO and even more so now. We have children being handcuffed and detained for trying to survive when the question should be, are we helping them to survive? Now, despite NGOs and SCSOs stepping in and increasing the efforts to support, provide and protect these children, we are in need of a more structured and sustainable solution to these issues. And this is only talking about basic safety and keeping alive, not yet the issue of education. Closely related to children are our women in the society. There's been a significant increase of calls to helplines reporting worsening domestic violence since the MCO started, with overwhelmed mental health counsellors on the other end of the line. How can we ensure these women's safety? Do we wait for a death before we act? What about our single mothers who are sole breadwinners, our foreign or stateless pregnant mothers who have no money to deliver their babies in safe facilities? What, are the, what about the other adults in this whole picture? Malaysians who have completely lost their source of income and not privileged or have internet facilities to be able to sell online, foreign workers who have been an asset to our economy and now struggling without work, refugees and asylum seekers who already have barriers to accessing basic services even before the MCO, what is their fate now? And what about those still fleeing death in their own countries and hoping for refuge in ours as a means to keep their families alive? Do we lose humanity during this crisis? So we have groups such as Ibantu, Abim, Femi, Yasan Guatanoe, Earth Air, Yasan Chowkit, Go Job, Solidaritas, Women's Aid Organization, Tratai, and many others who have really given their all during this challenging time to help these vulnerable communities in our society. But is it enough? And why do we have to worry about these groups of people? Because COVID-19 doesn't choose its targets. The virus attacks anyone, any race, any religion, any nationality. And remember that spider web I was talking about earlier, we are connected, whether we realize it or not. So as much as we have done our part by staying at home and obeying the restrictions of MCO in a relatively comfortable and privileged environment, if we don't pay due to the attention to the welfare, health and survival of others less fortunate than us, then we may face several risks. 
One is a risk of spread of COVID-19 within these communities due to poor living conditions or lack of healthcare access. Second is the risk of death from hunger or domestic violence or not finding refuge, which may well precede the virus itself. And thirdly is the longer term consequence of the stresses of MCO, including increasing mental health issues and worsening nutrition and physical health. So if parts of the spider web break, then our collective strength will weaken and we are only as strong as our weakest link. We will directly or indirectly feel the effects of other groups affected more by the MCO than ourselves in the months and years to come. And if not out of mercy and compassion, which is a teaching of all religions, let us do all, let us all do our part as our responsibility to keep the spider web strong. Thank you. We can't hear you, Dr. Paul. So sorry, everyone. Um, this webinar is brought to you by, uh, is organized by the Malaysia China Chamber of Commerce. And uh, you've just listened to Dr. Siti Munirah, uh, who has just described to us the situation from the ground in the NGO space. Um, Dr. Munira or Munira, if I may, uh, you've listed a few uh, vulnerable populations. Let me hyper summarize, yeah? Children, women, um, those with mental health issues, and fourthly, those who are stateless, refugees, and uh, the migrant communities. It's, it's hard to really pick up one uh, among them because all of them are equally important, but allow me to just pick up one of them. In recent days, we've seen some challenges um, or rather some uh, rhetoric uh, surrounding refugees in Malaysia. Maybe I can ask you a question about non-citizens, yeah? So broader than just the 180,000 refugees, but to talk about migrants in Malaysia, of which there are two to six million migrants in Malaysia and the stateless people, as a group, let's call them non-citizens. What is it that society can do for non-citizens and why is it that we should be doing more for non-citizens in Malaysia, Dr. Munira? Thank you for the uh, question, Dr. Kaur. So, um, firstly, the, the whole spider web uh, concept, I hope we understand that, you know, they are part of us and uh, looking after them is, is, is essentially looking after ourselves as well. And then secondly, again, as I mentioned, is it, it is a teaching of all religions to be merciful and compassionate for others, especially those who are struggling, uh, you know, in ways that we may not be. But uh, if I were to share uh, maybe uh, my own experience and maybe some of us who have been abroad uh, and where we are the minority in another country. So for instance, when I was in the UK, where there is, you know, there has, there's been a rise in uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric, you know, all this Islamophobia. And I've been on the other end of xenophobia, been on the other end of racism. And uh, it is it, not somewhere you want to be. And it makes, it does make you more empathic to the plight of others. And it just takes yourself to be in that position and to understand, you know, that person who we maybe re regard as someone else or an outsider is a father, a mother, or, you know, they have children just as we do. And just to connect on that level of humanity is what will, you know, make us uh, more empathic to their plight. And I think we can do it as Malaysians because we've done so much already in our capacity to fight this. It just takes us to take it to the next level and be, you know, take that compassion to other people who are, who are struggling. So there are many groups that are fighting for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can all play a part in supporting these groups uh, and ensuring their safety and their health during this time because at the end, it's part of our spider web. Dr. Munira, thank you so much for that answer. Um, if you've uh, just so joined can, us, uh, can I just yes, jump yes, in. please. From, policy, from a policy point of view, I think the Ministry of Health has done an excellent job making sure that they are tested, yeah, and then making sure that the ones who are positive, yeah, they do contact tracing and make sure that they are isolated. And okay, the Ministry yeah, of Health has not just done this for the refugee population. They've also done it for the overwhelming migrant worker population in the Selangor Mansion, the Malian Mansion, and City One. This is brilliant. I think we have to give credit, you know. And these this, this, this are the vulnerable population that we must we, we must identify. And then I was in, in Selangor Mansion and Malian, Malian Mansion on uh, about two weeks ago. And they provided all of them without fail food, three meals a day. Yeah. To, to all the migrant workers, but they, some of them were very, very hesitant to come down because it might be nabbed by the, by the police or the army, all right? And to the, to the 37 levels and 42 levels of CT1, we were providing for them, with them, uh, 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 dry food for them to cook. 
So I think from that perspective, the government and the militia, militia, uh, Minister of Health has done brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Musa. That's, that's indeed very true. Um, if we look at the case of Singapore, for example, there will be some, uh, say, a spike in recent cases due to the migrant population. So Malaysia's MOH, or Ministry of Health, is indeed learning from uh, other countries in terms of policy prescriptions. If you've just joined us, uh, this uh, webinar is on beating COVID with the whole of Malaysia. It's organized by the Malaysia-China Chamber of Commerce. We've heard from uh, Dr. Dr. Musa Nordin, or Musa as he prefers to be called, uh, about the policy prescriptions, about how Malaysia can fight COVID from Dr. Siti No Munira or Munira as she prefers to be called uh, about the NGO uh, view of things and how we need all of society to protect vulnerable populations. But we're talking about uh, beating COVID rather with the whole of Malaysia and this is where I pivot the conversation to Dr. Dr. Christopher Lee and uh, infectious diseases specialist. Um, Christopher, if I may, um, you, you have a, a tremendous insight into, say, the personal practices uh, of uh, human beings and citizens of Malaysia. What are your thoughts, Christopher, um, about uh, the personal and professional, or rather even practices yeah, in our personal lives that needs to change either during or after the MCO? Christopher, over to you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, uh, I just want to add something to what Musa had said earlier. Uh, in my opinion, the MCO has clearly worked. This is not surprising. I think most countries, if not all countries that have imposed some form of MCO has shown benefit at the other end of, of the whole operation. Basically, all this de is dependent on one main principle. It is a form of enforced social distancing. Uh, now, even as we lift MCO, and I'm quite confident it will be lifted in stages, exactly what Musa has said earlier, uh, the important thing, the principle of social distancing won't go away. That's why what Musa mentioned about testing is so important now, so that when we do lift the MCO, we are not doing it in the void or doing it blindly. We have some data to fall back on. We have more confidence in lifting the MCO. So testing, of course, is extremely important. Assuming the numbers all add up and the numbers improve over the next uh, whatever time we're talking about, uh, even as MCO is lifted in stages, I think social distancing must still be embedded in all our lives to a certain degree for a certain period of time. And that one is unavoidable. I, I think we need to do that. And why has MCO worked? I think uh, kudos to the government and the Ministry of Health in particular for driving the MCO. I think it was much needed. But now as we lift the MCO, now the responsibility and the spirit of social distancing falls back onto us, the individuals. After the MCO is lifted, there'll be more liberties returned to us. We can do this, we can do that. Of course, with some restrictions still on board. But then the concern is this, when some restrictions are lifted, some of us may suddenly feel very free to do the things that we used to do back in the good old days or the bad old days, whatever you call them. Uh, and then things can suddenly very easily explode if our surveillance on the ground is so strong enough and we are missing certain pockets of infection that's still going around. So just now, both Munira and Musa talk about some of these populations. It's absolutely crucial. It doesn't really matter whether you're a foreigner, Malaysian, refugee, or undocumented, or whatever it may be. Uh, we all breathe the same air, unfortunately, and we all be affected. Uh, when the boat sinks, all of us will sink together. Uh, so clearly, we need to put all this in place. So uh, today, you have asked me to talk about uh, what an individual or a family unit can do when the MCO is lifted. At the end of the day, we are probably millions of families put together to form one country. So each in family unit or each individual will have a role to play. And so I'm going down to the very basics uh, of what one can do. And I guess we can divide uh, our lives into three main areas. One, of course, is our own personal life or family life at home. What we need to do to keep our family going and, and integrated and carry on with the function of a family. The other major part of personal life is work related. When the MCO is lifted, more and more of us will be returning to work. And I think this is something that many of us are concerned about. And thirdly, uh, social events. Human beings, we, all, we are all very social people. We, we, 
we all now miss gathering and coming together, having meals together, gossiping together, whatever it is. Uh, and we all enjoy that to a certain degree. And we miss that. Uh, and uh, so well, I'll divide my, my short uh, preamble into three, these three uh, broad areas. So let's talk about simple things like uh, our personal life. And I think uh, the issue, the, the cornerstone of, of uh, infection control, of hygiene, cough etiquette, uh, I, I won't, I won't uh, belabor those points. Those must be carried on. I hope Malaysians have learned uh, this time and not did what we did during H1N1. During H1N1, all of us were very obedient, uh, with cough etiquette and things like that. But once H1N1 went, flew off, uh, we didn't seem to be so concerned after that. And that is a worry because this... COVID-19 is going to last for quite some time, we know that. And at the end game, I think likely it will be linked to the effective vaccine if and when it comes along. So uh, those issues of, of hygiene needs to be carried out. And I hope families will try to maintain that. This is a time because in the 20 over years, uh, we have seen at least four novel infections affecting Malaysia directly or indirectly. And the next 10 years, will there be some more I think you can bet on that. It will come. It, another one will come along the way. Uh, the other part of uh, personal life is our own cultural behavior. Now, all of us have stopped shaking hands now, which is a good thing. Uh, and I think we have learned how to say we knock shoulders, we put our, our hand over our chest, or we do a bow or whatever it may be. I think that's a great thing. But when the MCO is lifted, will people start shaking hands when they meet each other on the streets? Will that happen again? And I hope that culture needs, that is unnecessary. We can be equally polite to each other and give greetings without having uh, to shake hands. After all, it's cultural, it's totally cultural. It's not a religious uh, 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 requirement. Uh, so some cultural changes uh, need to happen. Uh, our daily interactions will have to change. How do we go to the shops? How do we get our groceries? How do we practice our religion? Now, some of these things will be linked to the religious organizations and the religious departments. And I'm sure they will start putting more things in place, how we can congregate in the masjid, how we can congregate in the church, et cetera, et cetera. So that one, I won't talk about that, uh, but clearly that has to happen. One part of the family I need to stress is the vulnerable part of the family. And for all of us, I think we agree, our elder folks. Uh, I'm careful when I say that because I'm joining that. I, I have joined that rank, so, so you have to be nice to me and also maybe Musa. Musa still looks so young. But uh, we yeah, have to be careful with us, eh? our own. <laughs> yeah. We have to be happy with our, our older folks. Um, and we have to focus on that. For example, if you're if our elder parents or grandparents don't have to go out uh, during the next, even an MCO is lifted, I think that's a good thing. Or minimize their exposure going out. Uh, many of them may be restless. They've been home for, what, 40 odd days, as Munira said. Actually, Munira, I stopped counting. I forgot. <laughs> but 40 odd days is a, quite a long time. And I'm sure for elderly parents, including my mom, she is restless. Uh, she wants to go out, says, why I don't take her out? Thank God I gave the MCO as a good excuse. But they'll be restless and we need to focus on them and make sure that they are careful. Especially, I think, not forgetting many of the older folks who live on their own. Exactly what Munira mentioned. They may be in the smaller towns, they may be urban areas, maybe even the kampongs. And they got to go out to get food and get the other necessities. So I hope families, especially if they are far away from our parents or grandparents, we must not forget them because they carry a much higher risk. I'm going to move very quickly over now to, to the workspace. Uh, I think for many of us, that is one major concern. If there is another cluster exploding, uh, it would be that in the factories, uh, in the shops, uh, in the estates, or et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think here, the important thing is now, the lifting of the MCO, let me go back. The lifting of the MCO must be a health decision, must be based on health. The numbers must add up to say it's safe enough for us to open. How MCO is lifted must be a joint operation between the health people as well as people from the industries. Because if you ask me, how do I open this factory? As a doctor, I wouldn't know. I can tell you what are the things that make that 
that factory unsafe in terms of social or human interaction. But what are the services, what are the processes that the factory or the factory workers have to take? Only the factory people would know. So we have to work with the industry to find out how we need to continue this work, how to do it safer. So a lot of preparation needs to be done. Uh, and I think MCO basically has bought us time to prepare. And I do hope industries are preparing now uh, so that when we do lift, these things are in place. I just want to add one thing in terms of the workspace. Whatever we do, the work culture will have to change. A lot more things will be digital platforms. When visitors or clients come to our office, I think all of them should be logged in. It can be through an app or it should be old fashioned pen and paper, but the login is important because if there is a cluster, there's an exposure, we know who has come and who hasn't, and when they came to the office. These many things, this is already happening in many offices, but it has to happen all the time. Uh, at workspaces, I think bosses, and I'm happy to talk to MCCC here about this. How do we make your workspace safer? It might be an office. Is your office space safe? Is your office space crowded? Do you need all your staff to come to work at the same time? Can you stagger their work? Can you come on off days, etc., etc.? When you have breaks, everybody goes to the pantry, everybody goes to the tuck shop or canteen or cafeteria. Do we need to break at the same time? Uh, things like that. It might seem simple, but yet that has to be put in place. Uh, so bosses, and I don't think we can, we need to leave this to the government to tell us what to do. Uh, many of us run our own organizations, our own companies. I think for the safety of our staff and also the ability of our company to continue to do what they do, that is to make a profit if, 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 uh, so that uh, yeah, people can earn a livelihood. I think that's very important. So the bosses need to start planning for that. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about something about social events. Uh, I have a friend who runs a, a cinema chain, and he was talking to me on the phone a couple of days ago, and he's very worried. He says, How do we ever open the cinemas again? And he called me, supposed to be a good friend, hoping that I would give him some sound advice and try to make him feel comfortable. I couldn't. I don't know what to say to him. How do you reopen the cinemas? Tough call. Uh, I think more and more already movie studios in New York, are, are in, 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 in Hollywood, are moving towards online screenings now, isn't it? People pay online. So you want to watch the next Avengers, you don't go to the cinema, you pay for it. You watch in Musa's 100-inch TV at home, that kind of thing. So and we sense around and all of us go do that. That's a reality. Because now when will we feel comfortable to go to the cinema again? When we feel comfortable to go to a restaurant? I miss some of my favorite restaurants and I've not been able to go, obviously. The takeaway is fine, but it's not the same sometimes. I'm sure all of us agree. When will we feel comfortable for me and my family to go to these restaurants again? And how do we make it safer? So, for example, I think there should be guidance from industry's concern for proprietors and owners of businesses to, to have guidelines to how to make their, their, their shops safer. For example, maybe going forward for many of our fixed uh, establishment restaurants, Everything will be via reservation. You call in, you fix a reservation, and you come in each table, not more than X number of people, five or six, whatever it is, and the tables are moved further apart. If your dining area can take 20 tables going forward after MCO, maybe only 10 tables, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are just some uh, the things that other people have done, but this needs to be prepared now. We cannot say if tomorrow MCO is lifted, we start figuring out tomorrow we got to figure it now. After all, we are stuck at home, nothing to do. Might as well <laughs> look at all these things, isn't it? Uh, and lastly, I think uh, uh, we have to ask ourselves now. I asked about when would I feel comfortable to go to my favorite restaurant? I guess it boils down to how essential it is versus how safe the figures or the situation on the ground feels to me. Uh, I mean, all three of us here are medical doctors, and of course, we look at numbers. You know, you heard Musa's comments about looking at numbers. I totally agree with him. And, and the numbers, if the numbers are co correctly collected, it gives us comfort that we are in the right place. 
but the numbers needs to be accurate as well. But if the numbers show that things are improving, I will get more confidence. You know, we have no, let's say, no new cases for the last one week, two weeks. I feel a little bit more comfortable and maybe I'll say, perhaps tonight we'll go for a dinner in this restaurant and only the five of us will go, perhaps. So how essential, it depends on that, that, that service and depends on the safe perception of safety that we have. So, so with that, I think I just want to conclude here. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, after what Musa has said in terms of policy of the, of the government of the day, uh, what civil society, NGOs and CBOs need to do on the ground for our vulnerable groups. At the end of the day, it boils down to us individuals, each of us, uh, to make sure the spirit of the MCO, of the spirit of social distancing uh, continues. Thank you. Christopher, thank you. Um, you, if I can summarize a brief one, uh, is to say is to apply an architectural theory to what you said. There are three spaces of human activity. The first space is the home. The second space is workplaces, offices, uh, and uh, factories, schools that we spend a lot of time in. The third space is a social space, places of religious worship, restaurants, cinemas, and so on. Uh, and I like your uh, say division uh, of, of what we need to change um, in the first, second, and third spaces. Can I ask a follow-up, please, for the benefit of our listeners? I've had a look at the list, and uh, it's a very wide cross-section of Malaysia. I suppose many of them are in the private sector. What suggestion might you have for them, or what requests will you make to them so that they can help the government craft rules for their specific industries? Because like you mentioned, uh, it's difficult for us to specialize in, say, uh, an electronics factory. So given the broad range of participants, what requests would you make to them? Well, I, I assume, and here is an assumption because I'm not privy to some of these discussions, industries, especially those that have been earmarked to be lifted. I think a few weeks ago, there was a list of certain industries that are being earmarked. Um, so I think it is the time, I, am, I hope they've been doing it even before this, the industries involved have been talking uh, with the ministry concerned on what needs to be done. There must be input from the health professionals in terms of safety, on what, uh, the, so that the spirit of social distancing and hygiene is put in place. One more thing I think is extremely important, and I hope uh, the people at MCCC, all of you are bosses and things like that, I hope this is made clear to you. We cannot leave the monitoring and, and, and surveillance completely to the Ministry of Health. It's no way they can do it. Just now, uh, Musa talked about the migrant workers and the foreign workers. Sure, we have Selangor mentioned, we have Malayan mentioned, but unfortunately, there are many mentions that you don't even have a name for. Isn't, and they are all over the place, and there's no way we can keep an eye. However, if they are foreign worker, they have a common umbrella. That is their boss, their employer, the company that employs them. They need to be the eyes and ears for the Ministry of Health in terms of surveillance. So surveillance and monitoring must be embedded in the industry. It cannot be somebody outside and say, MOH, how come you didn't come and check my workers? There's no way MOH, and I'm not trying to defend my previous <laughs> employers, but it's just not possible. It has to be inside our own company. If it's my company, my company has a cluster of, of workers who are infected. I will have to stop my work and I will lose money, isn't it, at the end of the day. But however, if I monitor myself, if there is an infection, I pick it up early, minimize the cluster, I can get back to work faster. So it's it's uh, their self-interest in there. Thank you, Christopher. If you've just joined us, we're halfway through the webinar organized by the Malaysia China Chamber of Commerce. The webinar is called Beating COVID with the, with the whole of Malaysia. So we had three panelists so far. I'd like to give a quick summary before we move on to the audience Q&A section. And we've already had some great questions. Um, but before that brief summary for the audience listening in, if you have questions, please uh, type them out uh, on two channels. Number one, into the Zoom channel at the very bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A button, so you can type your questions over there. Or if you're viewing on Facebook, uh, please go ahead and type your questions on Facebook as well. This is a request to the audience. Uh, if you're listening in and you have questions, uh, ask them digitally. As a brief summary, uh, Dato Musa, uh, at the very beginning, or Musa as he prefers to be called, uh, spoke to us about the policy implications to exit MCO, namely three, testing, tracking, and preserving the strength of the health system. 
what Dr. Munira uh, or Munira, as she prefers to be called, uh, coming from the NGO side, she's told us about protecting vulnerable populations, the children, the, uh, the women, the elderly, also non-citizens like refugees and the stateless. And uh, that's Dr. Christopher Lee, the third panelist, uh, fresh off his role as Deputy Director General of Health, spoke to us about personal practices that needs to change uh, after the MCO period and also the duty of employers, also the self-interest of employers in ensuring the safety of everybody there. Um, there as in uh, they are, they are the people that they're taking care of, I apologize for that. So uh, we're going to go into the audience questions right now. We have a few audience questions already. I'd like to group them into perhaps three broad categories. Yeah? The first one is what can we do now or what can we do differently now? Secondly, to talk about uh, what can we do differently in the future, especially in the post-MCO period. And then thirdly, to talk about uh, suggestions and recommendations about how specifically individuals listening in can take any uh, specific actions to, well, help build COVID in Malaysia. Um, let's, uh, let's go for it, yeah? The first question would be um, from Keith, yeah? Uh, I think uh, Keith has asked a question about what data points should the Ministry of Health or the government look at when deciding if and when restrictions or MCO should be relaxed or lifted. In summary, uh, how should we plan or what data points should we look at uh, whenever we're thinking about uh, lifting the MCO or relaxing the MCO? So I'm gonna leave it open to any of the three panelists. Um, Su Keng, I think um, the Ministry of Health has got on board uh, very precious data, which I hope be more, more, more shared with, with us in, in, in the private sector, in academia, and with those who are doing uh, plotting of exit strategies. Yeah? Um, as I mentioned to you, we are still behind in terms of testing. Yeah? We want to drive our positive rate as low as possible. I mentioned uh, Australia, Australia is 0.1.5, uh, Korea is 1.9, we are still sitting at 4.8. I think we need to drive it down further, which means we need to ramp up our testing. Yeah, And, uh, and uh, so the question that was asked in the star that, wow, does it mean that we, 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 we test 32 million people? No, we test as much as possible of the population so that we bring down our positive rate as low as is possible. When you bring down the positive rate, you can rest assured that the reproductive number, the RO, will be dropping. Yeah. We are now sitting at around one. When China had its best, worst scenario, it was 3.6. For every one case, it was spreading to about four persons. Now we are sitting at one, which is very good. But I think we need to ramp up. And why I'm saying we need to do this is because if you look at the Oxford Group Stringency Index, where they compare us with other groups, Speaking, you're from Oxford. I think this was from your team. They said that Malaysia was only doing 0.33 as far as testing is concerned. Australia was doing one. South Korea was doing one. One is maximum. So really one third. So we need to ramp it up at least three times. Okay. Uh, I, this is very controversial, uh, but I think that's my point of view. And secondly, I think... Uh, the index that's, uh, that's extremely important is tracking, right? We are now doing it very manual, very labor intensive. You know, the, the Singaporeans, they have 70 contact traces and they got the, F, the armed forces to help them with another 1,300. I'm not sure what the numbers are in Malaysia. We really need big numbers, but with app tracking, inshallah, I think we can do much better. That's what the South, the South Koreans are doing. They have... Um, they look at your, 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 your credit card reports. They look at your GPS. Where have you been? You know, it is very invasive, but they get it done. You know, if one person is COVID positive, it sends an alarm to all the guys outside him. And everyone who's been around him is notified. That's brilliant, isn't it? So I think Singapore is going that way, but the uptake is only 25%. Not good enough. You need something like a 60% uptake for it to be really, really uh, uh, effective, yeah? And Singapore has got a brilliant app and it's actually open access. The government can, can access the app. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, yeah? But I know in Selangor, they're already using an app and all the frontliners are using it. So if one frontliner is infected, he doesn't have to remember the guys who were around him for the past 14 days. The app will tell him, 
and his other friends will know whether they were in contact with him. So they can be traced, they can be uh, uh, um, investigated, and if possible, they can be isolated. So I think if you look at the tracking on the Oxford stringency index, Malaysia is only 0 0.5. We're only halfway there. Yeah. So I think that's the index that, that the question is asking about. So Oxford has done a brilliant job of putting us on the scale. We're actually doing very well in terms of percentage. We are something like 86%. We've done well in all the other cases, you know, closing school, closing uh, shops, you know, uh, not allowing guys on, on trains and all that. But this too is our sore point. We need to sort it out ASAP. Thank you, Musa. Uh, I'll be sure to say uh, your congratulations uh, to my colleagues back in Oxford. Um, you mentioned two things. One is testing, the other one is tracking. So these are two data points as we consider reopening up our economy in a phased restart, if I can use the term phased restart. Uh, Christopher, if I can ask you for your thoughts about other data points that we might need. Uh, well, um, uh, Musa already mentioned that we need to look whether we are having new clusters. Uh, I, I'm the, the data that's coming out in public domain, uh, we, we can't see that much. So perhaps I'm sure they're monitoring it, but we, we don't know. Are there new clusters coming in? Uh, I'm sure uh, there are some new ones coming. Perhaps they are small and they are closed off quite uh, quickly, hopefully. But one area I'm particularly worried, and this is because I'm an ID physician. Uh, we've been pushing for this uh, surveillance or screening of all SARI cases. Uh, severe acute respiratory infections, basically a pneumonia. Anybody who comes with a pneumonia, I don't care whether you went overseas or didn't go overseas or, or whatever, you know. But as long as you have a SARI and you're admitted to any hospital, whether government or private, uh, you will be, will be tested, provided that, that test. Now, uh, the other area is the ILI, the influenza-like illness. Uh, if you go to certain clinics, uh, you might be swapped. Now, this is surveillance, so they don't swap everyone, but randomly they swap some of these. Now, that is locked in in the ministry's database. I know that for a fact. And I'm concerned because in the last uh, 10 days or eight days, we still saw about 20 over SARI cases, ILI, around the country. Uh, I'm just a bit of concern whether we have looked into this number, where are they coming from? I'm making the assumption because most of the red zones in the past, in the last week or two was in Selangor, I assume that these saris came from the communities within Slango, but I could be wrong. I, we don't have the data. Uh, but what does that mean? The unlinked cases or these uh, uh, un, uh, unlinked cases or cases or sporadic cases that the public health people use that term. Uh, the problem is we don't know how they got it. Mm. And that means it probably reflects community transmission. So if you in the open up, if these men, if some of these saris come from one locality and we open up that locality, uh, even with the MCO you're getting, even with the MCO you're getting these unlinked saris, can you imagine if you open the MCO? So this again is another smaller data set which might be useful when we start looking at the more micro level. Uh, Chris, if I can just jump in, yeah? You know, yeah. these unlinked cases, yeah? That's one major cluster. This is what was described as sporadic. Yeah? My gut feeling are these are asymptomatic positive COVID. And that's why I am suggesting that we should do like we do for influenza. We do what's called sentinel surveillance. We have various sites in the country where we randomly test them. And you can find, you can bet four out of 10 would be, eight, sorry, the, 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 in the positive cases, there, there are about 11 data sets so far available that's reported 40% are asymptomatic. They are silent, they are carriers, Absolutely. spreading disease. This is worrying. Yeah? And, and this was the concern among the Singaporeans that they have these sporadic cases and many of them were due to the silent carriers. The second cluster that I think we need to address is the healthcare workers. This is a growing concern. Now, why do I say so? Because we look at the experience in Europe, one in 10 doctors and nurses is COVID positive. That's in Spain and Italy. In, uh, in Iowa, in the United States, one in five doctors is positive for COVID. Worrying, isn't it? And in, in Newport, I'm just, Cardiff is about 20 miles away where I studied. In Newport emergency room, 
emergency physician one in two is a COVID positive. So the danger here is that the doctors may be either acquiring it from the patient or the doctor is giving to the patient. So the, the hospital becomes a hostile COVID environment. So I think that's we true. really, so that's why in the NHS in the UK, which we, every doctor is now screened. Yeah, that's the move now. In fact, this, some of them are actually doing it every one to two weeks. So I think these are the two classes that we need to, to look out for. Well, to be, to be the, the, some of the policies, and I, I'm not defending anyone here, but some of the policies that we have now is linked to the access to testing. I'm sure you would agree because we can't test everyone yet. We are focusing on certain groups, but I'm sure that will be ramped up, especially among healthcare workers. You are right. Uh, we are seeing more and more healthcare workers getting infected and, and it's even from the hospital, it may not be directly from the patient. It's sometimes in the rest areas, we interact from one healthcare worker to another. In fact, the worry, the one I worry the most, and my daughter is now serving on the COVID ward in Sarum, but I keep telling her, Hannah, is when you get to your rest area, your rest room, when you take off your mask, that's when we let our guard down. That's where a lot of things happen. Uh, but Lisa is right. I think we will be get, they will be testing more and more. Uh, I think uh, uh, even the private hospitals, I know many of them are testing uh, their patients. Uh, I understand why they do that. I just hope, make sure the ethics of care is preserved that area. Uh, the other thing, of course, if you are testing patients to make sure the hospital is safe, you also may have to consider testing healthcare workers to make that same hospital safe because we are also a conduit for infection. Uh, just to add a point to what uh, uh, Musa said about the surveillance, uh, Ministry of Health has started the IL surveillance, as I mentioned before. IL, I, but now I think if you're focusing on asymptomatic, we may have to look at people who do not have ILI and screen them. Uh, and I'm sure we can find uh, some way of collecting this data, and that would give us a lot of confidence whether the average Malaysian walking around out there could be infected with COVID or not. Thank you, um, Christopher and Musa. I appreciate this. Uh, I would like to pivot the conversation perhaps a little bit uh, to, uh, to Munira as well to answer roughly the same question, um, but also to make a point uh, um, in my experience with health economics and just health systems in general, um, the testing strategies in other countries are also having the same problems as Malaysia, where we have to focus the available and scarce resources, mostly to high risk testing, shall we say, as we have, can manufacture more and more tests. And I think certainly we need to uh, expand to include sentinel surveillance and the broader testing for, shall we say, the asymptomatic carriers. Um, but for the advantage of uh, all our listeners, uh, let's broaden the conversation to also talk about, uh, say, the NGO side, the economic side as well. Um, and let me ask the question to Munira. Uh, Munira, or Dr. Munira, um, what are the data points that you might want uh, as, the, um, as the government considers um, say ending the MCO or transitioning to the post-MCO period and we're not really looking for health data points or scientific data points but anything that you want to tell us Munira. Thanks Dr. Thor. Um, yeah I think uh, from our side it's probably uh, not so much the uh, scientific um, you know evidence that uh, such as Dr. Musa and Dr. Christopher has mentioned um, I mean, on, on our side, what I can see from uh, the involvement of all these uh, NGOs and CSOs uh, in the society is our concern about the survival <clears throat> of these, uh, you know, if th these groups of concern, basically. And uh, as much as, um, you know, people want to extend the MCO because we feel that, uh, you know, like Dr. Musa said, okay, we want to push it down further, uh, you know, how, how do we do that? At the same time, we are thinking about, you know, how, how, how are these communities going to survive this, this, you know, longer episode, because a lot of them are uh, financially dependent on, you know, what they earn that day is what they give their families to eat, that kind of thing. So uh, for us, it's about thinking, how, how can we actually continue supporting these communities until it's actually safe to, you know, resume some normality of, um, previous life. I mean, it's, it seems that we're not never going to go back to that normal or what we call the new normal. But uh, for us, we already we are already feeling the things that we have discussed, you know, like Dr. Christopher said, going to restaurants or, you know, how we're we going to go back to work, sending ch children to school. But for these uh, vulnerable communities, it's maybe not even, you know, it, it is really basic necessities, keeping alive, uh, being safe, having food uh, to eat um, and not being, you know, caught by the police for being stateless, for, for instance. So, uh, you know, data points are like uh, out of the picture. It's like, 
uh, keeping these these people alive. So I think, in in our point of view, um, the more support we can get to continue. Uh, providing for these communities, which becomes our responsibility together, the more we can uh, um, help to keep the, the social distancing, the, the MCO lifted in stages, um, so that you know everyone is safe. Um, but yeah, specifically, so, so for us not to ignore these, these vulnerable groups, basically. Munira, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you a follow-up uh, um, question, which is a, a question from the audience as well that I'm repackaging a little bit, yeah? Uh, and we'll start with you, Munira, if, I, if we can. Um, on one hand, we need to protect lives by the MCO and social distancing and keeping people at home with lots of restrictions. On one hand, we need to protect lives. On the other, we need to protect livelihoods and the economic restart of Malaysia to ensure that Malaysia doesn't lose 2.4 billion ringgit a day because our economy is shut down. We need to ensure that people are protected economically, also socially. Lives on one hand, livelihoods on the other. Both are equally important. The, the question now to the panelists, uh, beginning with you, Munira, would be how do we balance lives and livelihoods? Um, it's a very, uh, I think that's the big question we have to ask um, and uh, it, it's going to be very difficult for all of us. Um, I think as long as both are definitely as, as equally important, yeah, we have to protect lives, we have to protect livelihoods. Um, I think what I would like to create awareness about is, you know, for all of us to be aware about the people who are struggling, uh, you know, due to this MCO, uh, but also how to keep them safe. Like Dr. Musa mentioned that, that you know, the government has made an excellent uh, effort in making sure these communities are tested, but we also have the communities that didn't receive that information, you know? So we do, we still do have pockets where maybe we are not reaching the, the testing capacity or whether they're not even aware. Like, um, uh, interestingly, this uh, last question where, you know, how can we, uh, ensure people are, are even aware of the social distancing of, um, you know, once we start being um, uh, more relaxed with the MCO starting to open, uh, you know, uh, services, uh, I think one of the big issues that we've faced uh, that has been a challenge is a basic principle of honesty. And I would really like to, to raise that issue because um, <laughs> I think that our honesty has been uh, tested at a large scale this time, you know, with people not coming forward to be tested. And that comes from men, you know, not just certain clusters, I mean, even from doctors or families of doctors. Um, and, and this is something that we really have to be, we have to pay attention to if we are going to move forward. For instance, if we start uh, allowing people to move within the the one state, but not cross borders. Are people going to be honest and not cross the border? Do you know what I mean? So all these things, and um, I think uh, those are the, the 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 preparations that we have to be, uh, you know, uh, ready to put forward, but also to spread the information within not just the communities that we are comfortable with, but to other communities that may be not, you know, directly connected to us, but will be affected if we don't do this in a in a structured, organized manner, protecting lives and also livelihood at the same time. Thank you, Munira. Can I pivot over to Christopher for your thoughts about how to balance lives and livelihoods? Okay. Um, I think this balance is extremely important as you have said, uh, but because we are lifting the, the, and when we start deciding what to lift first, I think number one, we need to lift industries that are really driving the economy uh, of the country. I mean, we have many different industries in different sectors. Some sectors are very minor. Some sectors may be major. We, I, I, from the economy standpoint, I can understand why we look at the ones that's making the most money for the country. I understand that. But we can identify that quite easily. We know what industries bring money to our country. The second question we have to look very carefully is, how safe is it to open this? Now, certain industries can be not very physically interactive. For example, let's say, I don't know, telecommunications, perhaps, you know, uh, it may not need people to physically interact on a, on a very frequent basis or very close proximity type of interaction. Uh, and so it might be easier. And I'm here, I'm just conjecture. I, I'm not a telecommunicationist, uh, but it might be easier to open this industry uh, because in terms of safety from the issue of, of, of COVID, it is safer. However, certain industries like service industries, uh, uh, it might it will drive some part of the economy, but the interaction needed 
to run that service is closer. I, I'm not trying to make fun of anything, but let's say the barber shop that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, the last time my barber cut my hair, he was pretty close to, to me. And uh, of course, uh, uh, he would be worried about me and I would be worried about him, obviously. Um, so my hair is kind of long. I can see Musa also long hair now, you know. Uh, but we live with it. It's not so essential. But yes, the barbers are not making income. I get it. I get it. But unfortunately, to run that service, we need to be fairly close together. Uh, so based on divide, separating essential, the, comparing the essentialness uh, of this service plus the risk, uh, I think it weighs very easily. It's probably too risky to go first. Let's do it later down the line. Uh, because the fear is this, when we open up the economy, then we later we have to stop because we have clusters coming up everywhere. It will not be good for the country anyway. We cannot be start, stop, start, stop all the time. It, we just cannot build on that. I think the country has to gradually open and confidently, as we open more and more, the data tells us we are in the right track. We are more confident to open even more after that. So it has to be that direction. It cannot be stop, start, stop, start. Uh, Chris, Thank speaking, you, can I just butt in? You know, yes. the, 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 our economy, yeah? the buttress of our economy is 6.7 million of migrant workers. We, we really need to think, think through this, man. They are now locked down. They are the, 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 the engine of the industry. So if Good I question. may suggest, you know, this is a wild suggestion, but I think it's doable. Because we need to track them, you know, make sure that if they are not well, they are in their dormitories and not out there working. So actually, everyone has got a smartphone, man. You know, uh, they've got a big, and the penetration of our phones is something like in excess of 90%. I think if employers make it wajib, huh, that everyone downloads the app, the tracking app. This is what South Korea does. If you are a foreigner, you, you drop at the airport, you must download the app. And then they will quarantine you for two weeks. If you leave your hotel, you will be caught within 10 minutes by the police and you have to pay a fine of 6,000 USD. Similarly, with our, with our migrant workers, which is extremely important for the economy. Yeah? And I'm sure the employers are crying, but they are not in the, in, in the country. We get them tracked. We get a decent tracking device. We, we pinch down from Singapore, open access. Yeah? Uh, if it's done, then I think we've had it done. We may get that 60% easily because one in five persons in Malaysia is a migrant worker. That's just a wild idea. And, and, and I, I agree with you. I think it's doable because all migrant, most migrant workers anyway, not all, many of them communicate back home. They do use smartphones, you know, and the smartphones are getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, although that is doable. So if the employers say, I want you to come back to work as long as you're healthy, but to come back to work, this is the requirement. You put that app in and we help to monitor your health. You know? So I, I agree with you. I think it's doable. Probably cannot cover every migrant workers, but we don't have to cover every single one. It's just the critical mass that we need to cover. Yeah, sure. Not so well. I think Musa, not so well. <laughs> I love the idea and if I can add two thoughts to it, the first one is a carrot, the second one is a stick. We can offer carrots and sticks for people to download the apps. Carrots could be you download the app, or you can travel interstate or go back to work, for example, or we give you one gigabyte of free data every time you download the app. <laughs> the stick approach could be that you don't download the app, we don't let you go to work. So this would be, uh, say, a carrot and stick approach show to encourage people as well. Um, Musa, if I may, um, would, any other thoughts about uh, how to balance within lives and livelihoods? I, I love your migrant example because they are the backbone. But beyond that, would you have any other thoughts? My thought will be on spiritual life now. And because I'm so worried, I'm sick worried, you know, when the, pr prime, minister, the prime Minister of Pakistan lifted the restrictions and allowed the, the, the Pakistanis to do their five daily prayers, to do their uh, 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 Friday prayers, to do their Taraweeh prayers, to do their eat prayers, you know, one meter apart. Wow, to me, my heart sank. And that's why I say, MashaAllah, we've got excellent religious leaders here who undoubtedly made sure that the mosque is closed, right? Uh, uh, you know, that we have, and, think, and Indonesia did brilliantly, and I, I, I actually wrote Jokowi, he said brilliant, but despite Joko is uh, stopping them to 
enter the mosque, they will get crashing into the mosque. This is what I call misplaced religiosity. I think, <laughs> I, I think we're doing fine in Malaysia, but we wrote, we meaning the Federation of Islamic Medical Association, this is physicians, Muslim physicians in 50 countries. We wrote to Imran Khan, uh, we told him, please, uh, because Pakistan is looked upon. You've got, you're the second most populous Muslim nation. You know, we got to get our spirituality right. And I told him, I told him in very polite terms, this is all based on good Islamic history. Because the prophet said, you know, if you see a plague there, you are in there, you stay in. And you're out there, you don't enter it. Which was 1,400 years ago. And in fact, 17 years after the Hijrah, there was a plague. And the top two commanders died. And the third commander was Amr bin al-As. This guy is a political genius. You know what he said? Hey, guys, he told his army, because they were sent to, to fight with the, 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 the Byzantines, the, the Romans. They said, guys, break ranks, break camp, go up to the hills, you pray there. Once the plague is over, you come down. That's physical distancing in, in, in our, our Muslim history. Once the plague was over, they all came. And then next year, 18 after Hijrah, they conquered Egypt. So, so I'm telling the likes of Joko and, 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 and our great leaders and the scholars that this physical distancing, the closing of mosques, you know, the, the, the stopping of azan is based on our Islamic legacy. So that's for our spiritual health. Wallahu alam. Thank you. Terima kasih, um, Datuk Musa. Um, the question was, how do we balance between lives and livelihoods? That's a short summary of the answer. Honesty, communication, transparency, all that is important if we're going to balance lives and the livelihoods. Secondly, to talk about uh, opening by industries and by sector based on how essential they are and then building in health expertise to make sure that we can control the risks. Number three, making care of the migrant population because they are the backbone of the economy. We need better solutions for migrants. It could be testing, it could be apps and so on. And fourthly, um, not only balancing lives and livelihoods, but I guess uh, physical lives and spiritual lives, if I may, Musa, uh, just to say that uh, this is a very difficult balance to strike. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've just joined us, we are um, 15 minutes away from the end of what I think is a great webinar. We will end at 12.30 the p.m. There's a number of questions coming in right now. Unfortunately, we won't be able to answer all of them. I do want to give some space for the panelists uh, to summarize uh, two minutes at each at the uh, end of the webinar. If it's okay, right, uh, we will go on perhaps uh, for uh, Christopher to begin the answer to the next one and then to, to Musa and then to Munira. Uh, it's a question about uh, what can other uh, ministries do um, and with ministries and agencies, right? Because a lot of the emphasis is a lot about, uh, say, government, uh, sorry, the Ministry of Health, but we're not uh, really thinking about other government agencies. So if you could specify one or two government agencies uh, that you think uh, could participate in the uh, fight against COVID and what can we do or what can they do more specifically? And then we'll end with a question uh, later after this uh, round about a question about what can the, the participants uh, in this call do? So let's begin with a uh, specific non-Ministry of Health government agencies. What can they do? And uh, if you can be a bit more specific, that would be really appreciated. Christopher, if we can begin with you, your thoughts about other non-health ministries given your previous role as Deputy DG of Health. Right. Uh, well, I think in my mind that uh, all the ministries are important, but okay, since you only let me have a few minutes, I'll talk about two ministries that I have some immediate concerns about, which I think they have to have a very big role. Uh, that, of course, one, one of them is the Ministry of Manpower and Labour, because they look after all the workers basically under one group. Uh, I know they come from different industries, but this is, at the end, it's also a worker safety thing. And I think the Ministry of Manpower can put in some general overarching guidelines to tell industries these are the guidelines, the generic guidelines that you must put in place. For example, I've been talking about this uh, embedding the monitoring surveillance system in the company or in the organizations. To me, that's the only way forward uh, uh, that we have to monitor our, the health of our staff. So put, them, put that in as a worker safety uh, requirement and then each different industry can look at the details. For example, if you're making you're involved in the rubber industry or mining or whatever, the, the processes are very different, obviously. So uh, the individual industry has to work out the details. At the end, it must be with the input of the public health or infection control specialist to make sure it's safe. 
The other second thing that comes out frequently, especially among some of my neighbors, they said uh, when they open the schools, I don't want to send my child to school yet. Many people say that um, the kids are quite happy not to go to school, at least their kids anyway. I noticed that. Um, and they're always worried. I'll say, no, no, must go to school. They are very happy when I say, I, I understand. Uh, but schools have to look into it. And I'm sure they must have been doing it. I, I hope so. Uh, but I think we have to make sure this is understood. And this is a time to share with parents when the schools open. The schools cannot be closed forever, isn't it? When the schools open, this is the way we will do it. This is how we monitor. These are the guidelines we will put in place. This is the changes that will happen in the timetabling of your school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Certain activities may go, but certain activities may change on a different platform, perhaps. But I think why is putting on these guidelines now important? It gives people confidence. We've got a plan. If you got a plan, even the plan is not perfect, but at least you got a plan. People know that there's something in place. And then we can argue whether we can tweak here, tweak there, and things like that. But without a plan, uh, sometimes we just have to trust our authorities that they are doing the right thing. Uh, but all of us are skeptics a little bit, like Musa. Like Musa is one extreme skeptic, okay? <laughs> Musa oh, is angry at me. Uh, but all of us are skeptic to a certain degree. So I, I think it's important to be able to show a plan and then people have more confidence in reopening as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, so you mentioned two ministries, Ministry of uh, Manpower, Labor, or these days, I think they're called Ministry of Human Resources, and certainly the Education, <laughs> Higher Education Ministries as well. Munira, what about you? What do you think um, um, in your work in NGOs, right? Uh, what do you think uh, some other government agencies, uh, I guess, could participate in the fight against COVID? Over to you, Munira. Thanks, Dr. Ko. So I think if we uh, go back to the groups that I mentioned, probably... Um, uh, we're talking about the uh, Ministry of Women and Family, uh, you know, to look into the um, protection, the, the, the basic necessities of children, um, especially in, you know, communities that um, are struggling financially. Um, and uh, those, you know, basically children should be protected regardless of whether they are Malaysians or not, so as long as they're you know, in our country, we, we, we need to be giving them the basic rights of at least, you know, food um, and ensuring their safety. So, uh, you know, I really like to see steps being taken to ensure that um, these children are safe at home. Uh, those experiencing domestic violence have actually a safe place to go to, uh, including the mothers as well. Um, I know there are many uh, helplines being open, but um, yeah, how, how much of it is actually, how many of these women and children are actually being protected at this moment in time? Um, you know, we have, like I said earlier, children being handcuffed and, um, and, and being interrogated for, for trying to survive this period. And whereas we should actually be thinking of why is this child having to go out and find, uh, you know, food to eat? So uh, I think if we could do that, then that would at least, again, like I said, if we protect the vulnerable communities, then we can actually prolong the MCO longer because we know these communities are being protected. And then at another level, if we're talking about education of these children, then, uh, you know, like Dr. Christopher was saying, you know, that our children don't really want to go back to school. Mine don't either, but I'm really struggling, you know, educating them at home while working from home. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are the more privileged where we actually have, you know, smartphones, internet, computers, where they can, you know, do their online learning. But we really need to think in terms of Ministry of Education, what about the children who don't have internet access? What about the children that, you, you know, how, how are they going to get the education? Um, and even if we change our ways, is it really going to be uh, accessible to all? And I think we really need to think about how we are going to do it, especially for those populations that can't access, uh, you know, the privileges that uh, some of us do have. Um, so, you know, specifically to women and uh, women and children, and also the uh, Ministry of Education in addressing these issues. Thank you, Munira. Um, over to you, Musa. Hey, thank you very much, Sukin. My my answer is very simple: the Ministry of Finance. Yeah. Okay. Let me be very, very uh, 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 down to earth. You know, 20 years ago, we were up there. We were as good, if not better, than South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. But unfortunately, in the past 20 years, 
our figures have actually plateaued. You know, we've not really shown any improvement in our mortality rates. You know, our NCD, NCD non-communicable diseases have just oh, blown off the roof. This, and if you were to look at the capacity of our Ministry of Health, the beds per population, the doctors per population, the nurses per population, I think to me, this is a wake up call. And in fact, when, 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 when we were advising the previous minister, we had a look at all of this data and we came up with a national health reform. Yeah, whereby we suggested there should be restructuring and towards non-profit corporatization and towards healthcare financing. These are issues that affects all of us because health is an investment. And said, therefore, this COVID is really a wake-up call. And I hope the Ministry of Finance would really consider making sure that we get the due amount from our GDP in terms of rehabilitating our Ministry of Health. You know, now you see PPE is not enough. That, in my simple opinion, or the layman's opinion, should be everything coming from the Ministry of Health because there was a failure to deliver. That's why you see some of our doctors using bin liners, cling firm, plastics. I mean, this is unbecoming of a middle upper class, a middle upper a nation. You know, we, that's why the CISO Monera has to come in. That should have been provided by the Ministry of Health if it was prepared. South Korea learned from MERS-CoV in 2013, and that's why when they were struck with COVID, they had a thousand per day. They were second highest after China. Boom, within a few days, they got it right. They, within, within two weeks, the genome was released, released by, by China. They had a company produ producing the testing kits. They had four companies now producing testing kits for 106 countries in the world. They've got 621 testing centers to do testing. They've got 61 drive throughs to do testing. And I, in Damansara Special Hospital, we actually, uh, like our hospitals in Ebola, we followed the model of drive through in, in Korea. And we did it in, 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 in Damansara. And we, as a private hospital, has got the largest number. We've got 5,000 tested, you know? Yeah? And, and, and the worrying thing is that 40% of those with, with, who were positive were asymptomatic. Yeah? And sure. so I hope, I hope the, the Minister of Health is listening, or at least the, 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 the powers that be are listening. And hopefully, we can invest a bigger percentage than what? 2.5% of our GDP in health because health is wealth. And now we see it, the pain that's the, we've lost what, a hundred of our citizens. Preventable death in my opinion. Wallahu ala. Thank you, Musa. Well, these are the ministries uh, outside of health uh, that uh, the panelists think uh, are important. Uh, firstly, manpower, sorry, human resources. Secondly, education and higher education. Thirdly, um, women's family and community development. And fourthly, finance, uh, each for separate reasons as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been such a pleasure um, having you on this call today or on this webinar today. We're five minutes from the end. There are some great questions, which I'm sorry that uh, we will have to ignore, uh, not ignore, but rather sidestep for now. I'm so sorry that we don't have the time for the questions right now but in the remaining five minutes that we have left uh, is it okay that i invite the panelists uh, in reverse order starting with christopher and then moving to munira and then finally ending with musa for one minute or two minutes uh, to just say uh, their final thoughts um christopher over to you thank you uh, just short and sweet it boils down to whatever policies that the government put in and whatever guidelines they cut in when the mco is partially or gradually lifted the onus becomes more and more on the individual uh, and in the community. So I hope we understand the spirit of social distancing. So even when the government lists the MCO, they are not saying there's no more COVID-19 cases out there. They may be, and they could be asymptomatic as what Musa has said. So therefore, we still need to apply the spirit of social distancing and hygiene. So really, when the MCO is lifted, it's really on us. How well we do post MCO is really 
on us. So I, I hope we all keep in for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Christopher Lee, who is the um, currently an infectious diseases specialist and previously deputy director of uh, health uh, in charge of research and technical, previously the chief uh, infectious diseases specialist for Malaysia. Thank you, sir. Munira, please over to you. What are your final thoughts that you want to share with us? Thanks, Dr. Kaur. So, uh, first of all, um, I would like to, uh, um, uh, you know, ask everyone to, first of all, to have compassion. And I think that's what got us, you know, through this so far. But we, uh, you know, there's definitely room for improvement. So, um, as you know, compassion is a teaching of all religions. So if we have compassion for the other vulnerable groups, uh, you know, those less fortunate than us, then hopefully we can help them to survive this MCO as well as ourselves until, you know, it's safe, uh, safer for all of us to resume some normality. Um, number two, uh, at being part of Project Wawas and Rakyat, which is a platform for youth, uh, I would like to, you know, invite all youth to be creative and innovative in how to uh, not just survive, but also contribute during this time. Uh, and I mean, this goes for people uh, outside the youth as well. But uh, I mean, just as an example, which is very small, um, the things that I've managed to do during the MCO, which is, you know, four, four or five projects have all just been being at home with, with uh, you know, a phone and internet connection. And, and those are very small compared to a lot of efforts by other people. But what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's so much we can do even from within the home. So get involved, you know, think of something that you can contribute to, even if it's one thing. Every, if everybody does, everybody does one thing, we can all make a difference. And um, number three, and the final point is, remember the spider web. So if we uh, imagine ourselves as one point in that spider web, we're actually connected to four strings, yeah? If we're the point. So one, think of our family, make sure our family is safe. Like Dr. Christopher said, you make sure are you, if you have elderly parents, people who can't go out or are uh, maybe at risk of getting, uh, you know, more at risk of getting disease than we provide for them. Then the one of the strings should be our um, friends and neighbors. You know, if you are in a neighborhood, find out if there's anybody struggling, you know, go help them help them get groceries or financially or whatever um, the third one should be if we are employers think about our employees how can we ensure their uh, you know livelihood during this time and also when we start lifting the MCO how, how can we ensure the you know testing and, and that kind of thing but also including our faith communities because in Malaysia we are very much uh, you know close to our faith communities so uh, in that realm as well to see who else needs help if we are okay look out for other people and the final and fourth string is everybody else, is everybody else in society, including the vulnerable group. So even if you just choose one group to help, uh, especially during this month of Ramadan, you know, where uh, yeah. as Muslims we believe that the more we give, the more we will get. Uh, and it's not, uh, you know, one minus one equals zero. It could be 10 minus one, you could get a thousand. So uh, uh, keep giving. And in that, we hope that, uh, you know, God will provide for all of us uh, so that we can safely get through this difficulty together especially so for those less fortunate and in their suffering is uh, our responsibility to think of think to think of that as well and so hopefully uh, and part of our hashtag the project was and like yet we are definitely stronger together thank you thank you um musa if i may um let's uh, let's end with you um with your thoughts your final thoughts please thanks for being um two final thoughts one is medical the second one is social the medical thought is basically COVID sounds or has been so morbid, eh? Ayo. Um, but let me reassure uh, our colleagues, Malaysians, 80% of those who get COVID are well, okay? They're asymptomatic, right? Mild, okay? It's only the 15% that are severe that needs to be hospitalized and another 5% that's critical that needs to be in an intensive care unit. So uh, let's take care of each other. But the other reassuring thing is that this is most recent data. By seven days, you can move, you can COVID, you would have got the antibodies. But we need good levels of antibodies to be protected. But the thought is that, and this is uh, Paul Nichols from, 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 uh, from Hong Kong, the founder of SARS-1, he said that uh, the, the by, 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 by seven days, you've got the neutralizing antibodies that will protect you. And then the worrying, is that, but the worrying thing is that many people say, oh, you can, you can get again. But that's the exception. It's not the rule. 
most of them who get it will become protected for a good maybe one year, maybe two years. We mm. don't know. Yeah. And then even if you did test positive for COVID after being infected, the virus is dead. The risk of infection is extremely low. So rest assured. Right. So don't be worried and disturbed by the exception. Now, that's the first thing. Right. So I think those are good news to me. Yeah. Um, number two. I would echo what Chris said, that we must be model citizens, a good exemplary rakyat. Now, my call is for our leaders and for our politicians to be model leaders, model politicians. When we call for self-distancing, it's not just meant for the rakyat. It's meant for you at the top as well. And if you show a good example, and they see you in our television sets, inshallah, they will be model rakyats as much as you are model leaders and politicians. Wallahu alam. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Dr. Dr. Musa Nordin, consultant pediatrician, also advisor to Imaret, speaking in his personal capacity. Before that, we had uh, Dr. Siti Normunira, who is trained in family medicine. <coughs> She's a specialist in family medicine, and uh, she comes to, to us from the NGO world. Um, in summary, individual responsibilities and your duties as a citizen. Number two, compassion and caring for other people as much as you can. And on the final, hopefully more positive and optimistic note, uh, is to say that this is not as bad as we imagine. So some of the medical facts and the statistics imply that this could be something that we can win. On that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the webinar brought to you by the Malaysia-China Chamber of Commerce called uh, beating COVID with all of Malaysia. Uh, please join me virtually in uh, thanking our, uh, our panelists. So thank you very much again, Dr. Dr. Musa Nordin, Dr. Siti Nomunira Ibrahim, and Dr. Dr. Christopher Lee. Uh, we will see you again in the next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. If the panelists could stay for a second. We stop now. Oh, yeah, I'm still online. Oh, oh thank you, Dr. Musa. Um, Yok Ting and Miss Chin, uh, just to check, are we still broadcasting?